Hello and welcome to another Knitting Pod. I am Lena and I am so excited to sit down with you today. It has been, I think, about two weeks since we hung out and talked to you about knitting and all that good stuff. Um, I'm really grateful to you for being so kind and patient. Normally I tape every week, but I just really did not have the bandwidth um, to show up last week. I think, you know, it's such an emotional output sometimes and depending on what's going on in life, sometimes there's just not enough in the well, y'all. So there just wasn't, so I appreciate you giving me some time to refill my own bucket. And here I am, bucket full, ready to chit chat about knitting and life and all that good stuff. Um, so if that sounds good to you, then let's do it. Um, always start with, um, not life, always ending with life. So if you have only interest in yarn and all that good stuff, then let's begin. You know, I have to say, for having been gone for two weeks, I wish I had more to share with you knitting wise, but um, I guess it's just, I haven't knit as much as I would like to have, but what has really been on my needles knitting wise is the hand Tholm sweater by Petite Knit that I'm making for my husband. And I have made quite a bit of progress it, with it. As you can see now, it actually looks like a sweater. Um, this is just a very simple raglan top-down sweater. My husband, um, you know, is just not someone that goes for a lot of bells and whistles clothes-wise. So this is as fancy as it gets. Um, I finished all the raglans. I finished, um, you know, all that increasing, which I have to say, it's slim pickings for like interesting knitting with the, with projects like this. So. The raglan increases were fun. Um, I did, I have to say, discover one thing about increasing raglans, and that is something I didn't expect, which is um, stitch markers. So I have a variety of stitch markers in my life, but the ones, I've never kind of found a holy grail stitch marker. So what I was using for these was just these regular little, clippy ones just keep them closed and then i had them you know when you come to the raglan stitch there's two stitch markers on either side so that you know that that's the raglan stitch which you don't increase you're just increasing around it right standard um standard fare i'm trying to look for a different kind of stitch marker but anyway so i had these and i had those other coco knits little light bulb ones the little pins i don't have one right now but what I was discovering is every time I get to this stitch marker, its shape and bulkiness would make it so difficult to just do a simple make one right or make one left. And it was so irritating. And I didn't have any non-opening stitch markers. Do you know what I'm saying? Anyway, so the next time I was meeting a friend for coffee, or something, I was doing something by my local yarn shop that's like walking distance from me. And so I was like, I need to find some different stitch markers. So I went in there and I found these. Can you see them? They're little gold, kind of, they look like little twisty um, rings. They're so pretty, y'all. These were like $3 for two, I, $3 a bag. I got two bags here. Let me see if I can hold it up a little better. Um, I don't think the camera wants to show you. Do you see it? It's like a little, um, it just looks like a little twisted ring and it is so cute. This was such a game changer to use this instead of those opening ones because they don't get caught up when you're making new stitches. And so I have discovered that the right tools for the right thing are just even something as simple as this. Like we all know we need the right needles that, you know, some people like wooden needles, some people like really sharp needles. Like I cannot live without my Chao Gu um, interchangeables. 
but something as simple as stitch markers can make such a difference. So that is something that I discovered in knitting this very simple sweater. Not to mention, I've taken them out now because I don't need them, but I think I have one to mark the beginning of the round. Here it is. And it just like, it remind, it just brings me joy. It's like a little piece of jewelry in your sweater. You know, you just come to this point and it's this little sparkly, delicate ring. And it just, it adds to the joy of the process, you guys. I don't, I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but for me, it's those little things that just add that tiny bit of happiness and are so worth it. So have you discovered your, you know, tried and true stitch marker? I would love to know. It's just, there's so many out there. I would love to, you know, explore more of these fixed kinds. I've always used the open and close kind just because they're more, um, you know, you can use them for a lot of things, but I am sold on these little guys. I need to find some pretty ones and stock up. So any suggestions would be welcome. Other than that, I've talked about this yarn ad nauseum, I feel like. It is the uh, Sandness Garn Double Sunday, um, non-superwash. It's a DK weight. It's the colorway Into the Woods, which is a petite knits colorway. I'm trying to see, I feel like you get get the color better like this because the light is catching it. It's this really beautiful olive, big brownish green. I really love this color. Um, is it just like a joyful knit? You know, I think what's happening right now to me is this. I feel like I'm in a knitting holding pattern because it is September 15th today and the MCAL, the Mystery Knit Along, um, Stephen West's Mystery Knit Along starts, I think, October 4th or 5th. So I am just in a holding pattern trying to make progress on the things I have on my needle, needles until that starts because I don't want to cast on a new shawl. I don't want to cast on anything more complicated because I'm just waiting for that to begin so I can give all my knitting energy to that. Um, and so... This would normally be a project that I had going on the side while I had something more complicated going on so that when I'm feeling like working on something crazy and inspiring, I pick up the harder thing. And when I feel like just pure comfort knitting, I pick up this. Right now, all I have on the needles is this and my half and half triangles wrap. They're both just pure knitting. It's like this one is just stockinette, that one is just garter, and it's I love them both, but they just, I don't feel like my knitting life has balance right now, if that makes sense. I am one of those people I have discovered. I'm not a monogamous knitter. I like having like two or three projects going on at the same time because I need that level of interest and variation in my knitting life. I am still working on my cable sweater. It's over there. Um, there's not much new to show you, but let me just grab it real quick because I do want to be able to show you because you might not have watched my last videos about it. This is the Clarette sweater by Fia Coleman. Um, this is my first sleeve I showed you guys last time. Um, it's all knit in the flat and then you seam it all together. Um, I just, I love this pattern, but I had taken a break from it because it was giving me some strain in my hands. And I'm happy to report that my hands are so much better. I literally took just one week off and I went to my PT, I think I told you that last time, and she dry needled my arm and gave me some really simple exercises and that has helped so much um, that I cast on the second sleeve and here I am making progress and finding so much joy in this. Um, I just picked it up again, I think, last week. I haven't made too much progress. Um, but this time around, I feel like I have found an easy rhythm with um, cabling without a needle. And I just, it's not straining my hand or anything. So um, you can see those little cute gold stitch markers again here. So yeah, this is my more complicated project right now. But I'm just, I have to say, I'm missing having a shawl 
going. There's just something about a shawl that is, it's become, there was a time in which I knit a ton of shawls and then I stopped and I didn't knit any shawls. And now I'm totally back into being um, a shawl knitter. I just find it to be my favorite kind of knitting. I don't know, you're not worried about fit. It's just purely joyful. And so many shawls have both challenging um, elements in them plus really easy knitting in them. So I don't know, I miss knitting a shawl and I am counting the seconds till October 4th, which I believe is cast on day for the MCAL. Um, if you've never done one before, maybe you try this year. It is um, such a fun journey to take with so many other knitters around the world. And I'm not a big participant of, you know, Instagram or Ravelry. If you've watched my channel, you know, I can't quite seem to get myself there, but I really enjoy just seeing other people's projects unfold. And even if you're not, look, I am not gonna peer pressure you into doing something you don't wanna do because it is an investment of time and energy and it's a different kind of energy and you have to be willing to put up that kind of energy. And it depends on what's going on in your life. If you're really busy with work or you're really busy with family or whatever the case may be, sometimes we don't have a lot of bandwidth then to give to our knitting. But for me, I really enjoy giving control over to Stephen West creatively because to me, he is such a creative genius. He is so inspiring and, um, I have found sometimes I make assumptions about what I do or do not like, and I really just don't know what I'm talking about. I might have done something once, or I might just think I don't like something. And I think when you try something that you just don't even know what's about to happen, you're forced to try things and really give them a chance. And maybe you'll end up loving something you didn't think was you were cut out for. So I am just so here for it. It's the one time of year where I am like completely ready to just have faith in his creative genius. Um, and I know for a lot of us, you know, you might not traditionally wear something as ornate or crazy um, as he might bring, but again, I just, it's about the journey. It's not about the completed project even. And I have found, I've told you guys this before, I keep my shawls out, um, not all of them, because I have more than I have, I have more shawls than I have places to display them, but they are literally pieces of art. He always says that it's a wearable piece of art and I totally agree. Do I grab my MCALs every day? I do not, but do they bring me joy every day? They do. So with that being said, I finally decided on my colors and I have them to show you and I'm so excited about it. I'm really, really, really thrilled because I have done the last two MCALs um, because I'm pretty sure that's about all I've been knitting. I think I've been knitting for three years um, and I've done the past two, the shawlography and then twists and turns. And they have been markers in my own color evolution and almost like a more broad evolution that I have gone through. Um, I'll back up uh, just a little bit and say, I think a lot of you know, because I've talked about it before, but I moved in 2020, my family and I moved from Dallas, Texas to Boulder, Colorado. And um, that was a big change in, um, Culture is one uh, way probably to say it. Just, it's very different here in pretty much every way. And I feel like I have evolved and it's been such a joyful evolution for me to be go from living in a really big city to living a lot, what feels closer to like a rural setting and closer to earth. I see as just, you feel a lot more, close to nature here. And my evolution from loving bright, super processed, super wash yarn to really being drawn to earthier, sheepier, 
unprocessed, undyed yarn, it has been a real joy. Um, so my last two MCALs were super bright, like I said, just all the color, which I love through and through. But this year, I went in a different direction. And um, before I show you, I will tell you that my friend Jessica and I, she's doing it for the first time this year. So I'm really, really excited because she's been knitting forever, but she's never done an MCAL. So she was very excited to jump on board and I am really excited that she is doing it with me. So we decided to go to one of our favorite local yarn shops, um, Lula Fay, and we thought, let's do our best to buy our yarn, support our local stores. So we went there. And unfortunately, we just, nothing was clicking. So the best option we came up there, up with at the store was um, because she too has kind of traveled that same path of being more drawn to woolier wools and less processed yarn. And so we had, we both really found um, the Knitting for Olive Merino held double with, um, their lace weight, fluffy yarn, mohair, mohair. So one strand of mohair, one strand of merino. We thought that would be beautiful. And we came up with one color palette. I took a picture, I will, sh I will insert it here. Very natural colors, but still dyed. But you know, I think Knitting for Olive does a really good job of being transparent and um, ethical about, you know, how they source their wool and being eco-conscious about how they dye their wool. So we both felt good about it, but holding double all that mohair and all that merino was going to be a pretty penny, y'all. It was like, oh, almost $200 to make this shawl. So we both were like, okay, there's no rush. This isn't starting tomorrow. So let's just take a beat and think about it and, you know, toss it around a little bit more before we make the plunge because we weren't even sure because sometimes in the past Stephen Mo Stephen Mohair <laughs> Stephen West has said um you know use mohair or um I encourage you to take the mohair dare and like insert bits of mohair but he hadn't said that so we were both kind of like uh you know holding yarn double inserts a whole nother level of complexity and considering we don't know what we're going to be doing, will we end up, you know, being super annoyed with ourselves for overcomplicating our yarn choices? So we both did just a whole bunch of deep diving on the internet, trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And I have kept you in suspense long enough. Let me show you what we decided. And yes, we both decided to just do the same thing. So we're gonna be twinning and winning in our matching MCAL shawls, which I'm really excited about. Um, let me start from lightest to darkest. And this is the opposite, the order in which they are in my bag here. Of course, I purchased it from my favorite online yarn shop, Wool & Company in Illinois. I just, I've talked about them so much. I think they do a spectacular job. They have so much in stock and they're so um, sweet and kind and they go above and beyond. Um, they wind your yarn for free, which to me is just, can I tell you what how awesome that is? Because I have a ball winder set up and it's just such an epic pain in my butt to do it because you have to get all your stuff out and you have to make space and then you're just sitting there winding and anyway I the, I am just a forever fangirl for Wool & Co because they will wind your yarn for free okay so we decided on Isayer Alpaca 2 which is an alpaca 50% alpaca 50% wool in their they have four colorways that are completely undyed, and those are the four colorways we picked. This first one, I don't even know the names, y'all. Let's see. I don't know. It just says undyed, 100% undyed. I don't know, but this is the first color, and what we both fell in love with is the fact that we don't have to hold mohair double in order to get this 
fabulous halo, excuse me, that the alpaca is giving this. So because it's 50% alpaca and 50% wool, to me, that's just absolutely the best of both worlds. Because if you could feel this, y'all, it is a dream. It is so soft because of the alpaca. But the wool gives it a little bit more structure than just alpaca would have in a fingering weight. So it will have drape and structure and halo. Come on, y'all. What, like, what more could you ask for? I'm just so thrilled. So this is my color number one. The second color is this. I feel like it's kind of changing colors depending on where I'm holding it in the light. This one is much grayer, um, but still a light. They're all heathered. They're just, it just makes me so happy. I am counting minutes, I'm telling you. So this, I don't, again, this, it says E2S and this one, where did that other thing go? This is E0. So this is E0 and this is E2S. Um, and apparently they were so sweet because I ordered for Jessica and I both together just to save on shipping and all that. Um, in terms, the shipping is free, but just to make it more eco-friendly, um, we shipped it together. And so I ordered four balls of each because they're 50 gram skeins. And they said, you know, there were, one was a different dye lot in this one, but you can't tell at all. And, but I was, I thought it was very kind of them to send a note before they shipped it, just in case, um, we were going to freak out. So this is what we have so far. And then this is the third color, which this is probably my, one of my favorite. It's just a deeper taupey color. It is E76, no, E7S. Okay, let's see if I can hold them because I want you to see the progression of color. And then the final one is this absolutely stunning stunning, more brown, but still not super warm. There's still, to me, a bit of cool tone in this brown. Now, I don't know where in here this brown will go. Will I put it between these two or at the bottom of these two? I don't know. I know I'll start with the first two and then depending, I guess, on what the shawl, how it's progressing, I'm about to flip them so we can see it this way. That maybe seems, I kind of like that, I think, because the this one and this one both have a grayish undertone. So I think splitting them up gives it a little more, um, you know, I like the progression of that a little bit more. I don't know. What do y'all think? So it would be like this way or... that way. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. But now do you see why I'm so excited? Because I just, these are my colors that are just making me so happy right now. And to have found like the feeling, the yarn has the aesthetics and the composition, everything. It's just checked all the boxes for me. It's undyed. And I'm really, really into undyed yarn right now. And I'm also, Jessica and I were talking about this, how we were kind of like, shoot, we could have maybe next year. We thought about getting some local, because there's so many farms around here, um, some local undyed wool and doing some natural dyeing ourselves. And I thought, you know what? That's a good long-term project to kind of um, dabble in that over the next year. And maybe for next year's MCAL, we don't want to do an undyed one, but we can experiment with natural dyes, um, which I've been looking into and sounds so much fun because I found this one, you know, uh, online, this website that walked you through dyeing yarn with onion skins. And it was so, I just loved the idea. I cook so much. You have no idea how many onions I I peel and chop. Okay, y'all, you have literally no idea. 
to, to keep those skins and repurpose them to dye. It's just, that gives me the sparkliest of sparkly feelings. Um, you can use so many things that we just have in our lives, avocado skins, um, and it gives you these colors that you would never expect. So maybe next year, if I want to do a color um, other than just natural undyed, that is the route we will go because it just sounds fun. Um, and it sounds like something I could do with my kids, which makes me so happy. They love to participate in this kind of stuff. So I don't know. Have you ever dyed on um, your own yarn with natural products? Like not what I'm not interested in at all is having to wear like a hazmat suit to use chemicals and powders and stuff like that to dye my own yarn. That does not appeal to me. I don't want to do that. Um, I would love to experiment with natural, you know, vegetable matter and flowers and stuff like that. I know there's a book. I saw a couple, I saw it somewhere. Maybe it was at Lulafe that was about dyeing, um, with natural product. So anyway, that is that. So that is my MCAL uh, shawl and I couldn't be happier. It's truly like, I just, it's so different from what I've chosen in the past and I'm just so, so, so excited about it. I would love to know what you, a lot of you have already told me what, um, what colors you're using. Um, some of you are doing going for like the bright pinks and others. I know um, one of you had said you had found like a lovely progression of greens and deeper greens in your stash, which I love. I tried really hard. I took those two skeins I showed you guys last time to Lulafe. I just could not find anything to go with it that made me feel happy. It would have been forced and I just, I'm just gonna save those two skeins for what their intended project I had bought them for. So, um, because I loved that idea of what I had built around for that. So I'm not gonna worry about, I'm not gonna worry about using those. I, and this was super, I thought the ended up being like $90 for all this yarn, which is a lot, but a lot better than 190. So I felt like, I don't know. It was worth it because this is going to be, this is going to be my project for, I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but the rest of the year, like my goal is to finish the MCAL this year, 2023. It is September 15th. So I've kind of feel like my knitting projects are what I'm going to be knitting for the rest of the year. I've got planned out. I don't know if you guys are like that, but once it starts hitting to be September, I start feeling like, I kind of like my knitting to be contained within a calendar year. It just kind of is a journey for me. And I feel like I, I don't know. I like to know what the end of my year knitting wise is going to look like. So it's going to be finishing my husband's sweater. It's going to be finishing the half and half triangles wrap for my daughter, which is so, I've made so much progress. Like look how huge it is. I, I really enjoy this project. I, I really think it's because the yarn is so lovely and pleasant to work with. I just love it. It is beautiful. Um, I only have this much of the pink left and I'm really hoping that that's enough to get me through. Um, the rest of the short rows, I'm right here. So these are the unwrapped stitches. Or wait, is my saying that opposite? Whatever. I don't even know, um, but it is turning out beautifully. I'm really happy with it. But again, nothing that requires brain power there. Um, yeah, okay, what else? Moving right along. What else have I been doing? Um, I don't know how this came about again. Well, I guess I sort of do. A couple of years ago, I love, um, sometimes I watch Kristen Lara of Vullenvine. She has, she dyes her own yarn and sells it. And she has a podcast, which I enjoy sometimes. Sometimes she does, um, she does a lot of making. She does a lot of quilting and sewing. And I'm so not a quilter 
In fact, I think I actively dislike quilting. Um, so I don't watch when she's doing that. But when she's doing other things, sometimes um, she piques my curiosity. And one time a few years ago, she had like she had said she had lost her knitting mojo and so she was trying to dabble in other types of making and she went to michael's and discovered bead looming and i was totally intrigued and it's a real kind of low point of and low cost of entry kind of making so i went and got a bead loom and my son and i started bead looming randomly and then i mean we got pretty into it a few years ago but then somehow I like I got more you know back into knitting a ton and a couple of weeks ago my daughter was super into making friendship bracelets and so she was saying to my son I can teach you which I think is so cute do you want to learn to make friendship bracelets he was like I I couldn't believe this it was it was Sunday the day before Labor Day we had had friends over on Saturday night so we we're all really tired and we we're sitting around talking and she was like do you want me to teach you to make friendship bracelets and he sat there he was like no, but I really feel like bead looming. And I was like, it caught me so off guard because like he's such a little dude. Like he's so into sports, you would not believe. It was the last thing I anticipated him saying is like, I really feel like bead looming. He got up, he got all the stuff back out. And she was like, will you teach me? Because back when we were doing it, she was too little because you have to have a really you know, small, tiny needle, and it takes some finger control and precision that she wasn't capable of. And he was like, oh yeah, totally. They sat there for like four hours and he taught her how to bead loom. It was, it was quite incredible. Anyway, it totally inspired me to get my bead looming back out. And I have been so into it, y'all. So I made my friend Jessica, it was her birthday, so I made her a bracelet. I'll insert a picture of it here. And she took this picture and I think it is so beautifully composed. She knit this sweater. I forgot what it's called. Trinity? Is that right? I can't remember. It's so beautiful and she's so adorable. And I just, it was such a joy to make that for her. Um, and then right now I'm working on this one, which I just... It's like color work, y'all. It's like knitting color work, except it's so much faster. Like I, I started this yesterday and I don't, I don't know if you get, like if you can see, I don't know how to get the light, but in person you can see that these kind of very light coffee terracotta colored beads are matte and then some of these are have a sparkle they're sparklier so it's just like the contrast of the beads and watching the pattern unfold it's the same joy as color work but just different and I like that I get to do it with my kids um that we can all sit around we like sit around our island and just talk and bead loom and it's weird and cool and fun and it's just pure joy of making. Um, if you have any interest in this, ask me questions. Um, I can tell you where I get my beads online and what I use. And, you know, again, YouTube is such an incredible resource for making. I, it's, I feel like there's just not as many resources for this as there are for knitting, but you know, I'm slowly trying to figure out the best practices and best way to get the results you want. And this is going to be a bracelet, but I really want to make a hat band. I love wearing cowboy hats and rancher hats, and I would love to make a hat band. Um, but anyway, it's really giving me that sparkly feeling. And you know me, I just follow that feeling. That's my whole life warmer, moving towards warmer and moving away from colder, not weather, because I'm always moving towards colder weather, but that's feeling. I always, if it makes me feel warm and fuzzy and excited, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So that has truly brought me so much joy right now. And I love color work. Like I am itching to cast on something color worky, but this is kind of scratching that itch right now. And I just, I don't know, I love it. It's a fun way to mess with color also. Like I do think this would be a really good palette for color work in a sweater. 
Um, but yeah, so much fun. Okay. I think that's all the making I have. I'm, I'm I told you it's been it's been a transitional time. I'll pause on that and um tell you more about that in the life section of this podcast because I don't want to jump ahead because I do have to show you one or two cool things. Y'all know I love enamel pins. So I have a new enamel pin. My friend Sharon, so sweet. She went to this event and the Lafayette, Lafayette's just a little town here. They have a peach festival every year and she went and she found some enamel pins and she got me this enamel pin and it's so cute. This little snail, is he not the cutest thing ever? I feel like he goes so well with my little hedgehog and they're just, it's too cute. So thank you, Sharon, sweet Sharon. Um, and then my friend Jessica is so sweet. She said she was watching my episode where I talked about my knitting essentials and I showed that hideous blue measuring tape. And I was telling y'all how I was coveting the Rifle Paper Company tape that some of you had suggested to me. And she got it for me, y'all. She was like, you deserve better than that ratty, hideous blue tape, which I deeply appreciate that she thinks I can do better than that. And I am telling you, talk about a, like supplies, the right supplies bringing you just infinite joy. This just goes in that list. Look at this. Okay. So beautifully thought out. First of all, look at this gorgeous, like gold plated thingy. And then what I love is, you know, you got to measure your thing, blah, 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 which this comes in so handy, even with, uh, um, uh, bead looming. And then you just squeeze it and it pops back in. And it's just so thoughtful because there's not like an ugly button, but you can feel the button in here and it's just contained in this gorgeous fabric that just, it's just, it's so joyful. So thank you, my friends, for being so, so sweet and thoughtful. I was so touched and so thrilled to have upgraded my tape measure because she is correct. The tape measure I was using was just, it was not okay. Like, Friends don't let friends have hideous supplies. Okay, so that is my new acquisitions. Um, the other fun thing that we got to do this week was another one of our incredible local yarn shops. Like, it's Longmont Yarn Shop. I've, I've mentioned it many times before. If you ever visit this area, you need to go there because it is a vibe, man. I love it so much. It has this rustic log cabin feel. It's the coziest place ever. They have so many incredible things. They have so much yarn, local and otherwise. They teach incredible classes, weaving, spinning, knitting, crocheting, everything. And everybody that works there is just an absolute delight. They're just incredible. So anyway, they were hosting a beer hop brew, no, brew hop. It was a beer trolley. So it picked us up. You had to buy a ticket and it picked us up at this yarn shop. And then we went to three or four different breweries, local breweries in Longmont. And it was just more fun than anybody has any business having. Like I only knew my one friend, Jessica, she invited me to go and she had another friend going and didn't know anyone else. And honestly, didn't like make some deep connections with other people. I can be so socially awkward, you have no idea. Um, I'm just, I don't love like big groups, socializing in big groups, but this ended up just being so much fun because it's just like people that are obsessed with the same thing you are. So we would be talking about stuff and then people, we would start talking about yarn and Normally, like, that's just not normal conversation that I get to have in my life. My family humors me so much listening to my yarn talk, but it's really just a one-way street. They're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, nod and smile, and she'll stop eventually. But, like, when you're amongst fiber people, it is a total conversation, and it's so much fun to talk about all the things, designers, patterns, yarns, everything. It was just, 
it was such a fun night and I love beer and I love exploring. I've not been to any of those places and it was just such a special experience. I am totally in next time they do it again. Um, I just, it made me so happy. And it's like, you know, I live, we all live in our own version of the bubble of our life, right? So you see your kids' parents and you see the friends you have and you see the people that live in your neighborhood. But this was like, I just got to see people of all ages and they live in different places and just you get to be around new people sometimes it's just it's a treat and i i see that less now as a socially and social socially anxious situation and now i feel more just like excited to just be amongst those people like there's no pressure to come away with some deep friendship some new connection it's just to be amongst people that feel the same way as you so that was a treat. So if these opportunities present themselves to you, say yes. You know, yes, it's hard to find, you know, time. And if you have kids, coverage with your kids' activities and stuff. But it is a really good idea to get out of your comfort zone sometimes and do something new. And it might suck, but it also might be amazing. It's what we tell our kids right? I tell my kids this all the time. And it's nice to actually practice it and to put yourself in new situations that make you slightly uncomfortable so that you see what your own kids have to do all the time. Every day they have to be in these new situations and show up and show up and we can just stay in our comfort zones. And I think it's important to remember what it's like to have to try, you know? Okay. Rant over. Okay. It is the end of um, making talk on to other things. So if you want to say goodbye right now, goodbye. It was so nice to spend this 45 minutes with you. If you would like to talk about other things, here we go. Let's see. Let's do our climate tip of the week real quick. So we are already turning off the faucet when we're doing our dishes and brushing your teeth, but that's like really low hanging fruit. So I feel like I didn't even have to make that a whole tip of itself, but we're being mindful of the faucet. We're turning off the faucet to scrub our dishes and our teeth. We are batching our laundry to take advantage of the heater in the dryer. Once it's hot, it's gonna dry a lot quicker. It's conserving energy. This week, Oh, and then last week we decided we weren't going to use produce bags at the grocery store. We're bringing our own bags and then we're just putting the produce either into bags of our own or into the bags. We don't need to put them in plastic bags, okay? So that's where we are. Look how much we're doing, y'all. Look how much we're doing this week. This statistic really blew my mind. So I just had to tell you guys. Do you know that to make one pair of denim jeans, it takes, wait for it, 1,500 gallons of water. 1,500 gallons of water, 1,500 for one piece of clothing. That's not even comfortable. I gobsmacked. I was gobsmacked. So cotton is a very water intensive crop and it tends to be grown in regions that are already in drought. See California, see India. Places that already struggle with water are the places where cotton grows. The dyeing process, the whole thing. Y'all, we have got to become more mindful of our shopping practices. I think that one of the saddest developments of just the culture, the capitalist culture we live in, is this sense of constantly needing to acquire new things and forgetting how many resources go into creating each of those things. 
And then we think of them as disposable and we think of ourselves as heroes when we are like donating old clothing, when so much of that clothing ends up in a variety of places that's not eco-friendly, either in a dump or shipped across to a different country, a different continent. Like, here's a thought for you. There is no away. Like when we say throw away or give away, there is no magical away where it's just like, poof, the thing is gone. It goes to a landfill, it goes somewhere. The only way to cut down in how much we throw away is to just buy less. Like we don't need to buy new jeans every year. I don't even wear jeans, y'all, because I'm like a toddler and want to be wrapped in soft things and denim with its snaps and buttons digging into my body is just not appealing. But let's, my tip to you this week is just be mindful, be thoughtful of when you're buying denim, denim jackets, denim jeans, denim vests, God forbid. I don't know what all the things of that we can make out of denim, but buy secondhand, donate, swap with your friends. If you have kids, swap with your kids, friend, uh, your kids' friends, like create situations in whatever way you can to just buy less and specifically buying less denim. And I really think this crowd is particularly receptive to this. We take months to create one sweater, right? We we love slow fashion. I don't, I don't know, fashion isn't really like something, I don't think of knitting as fashion. I think of it as, it's just closer to my heart than fashion. You know what I mean? It's not just something I'm putting on my body. It's just like an extension of me. When I, I think that's why I love knitting so much is when I wear a knitted garment or a handmade anything, I feel like it's an extension of me. It's not just on me. Do you know what I mean? So we're already thinking that way. Let's just take it a step further. So the rest of the things we're putting on our body, the best thing you can do is wear the things in your closet. You know, like we all, even me who doesn't even wear jeans, has so many jeans from over the years. Just find a way to, you know, Style them to make them feel like you. You don't have to buy whatever latest trend in denim. It's just, I don't know. Trends to me are for the birds. Like, I don't do trends. I do what appeals to me and that's it. The end. Like, I can't keep up. That's the best part of getting older. You don't care about keeping up anymore. Anyway, okay, so that's it. Oh, that's not it. I did want to share one more thing. A couple of, I don't remember when it was, but I read this article in the Washington Post that I was just kicking myself that I didn't bookmark or send to myself so that I could share with you. But the gist of the article was that, you know, we, we think we're getting news about the climate when we get all these horrible stories and all these horrible statistics. But really the whole picture also has a whole nother half of really positive, optimistic progress that we are making. And what happens when we leave out that entire half of the picture of the good things, of all the work, of all the people like you that are working on the micro level and all the scientists and people that are working on a macro level to do, to make progress in climate. When we leave out that half of the picture, all we see is doom and gloom. And you know what? That is not very conducive to optimism. And one of the architects of the Paris Accord, the Paris Climate Agreement from 2015, is Christina Figueres. I wanted to make Figueres. I, kept, I keep messing that name up. And she said that we need to develop a gritty optimism to combat climate change, to continue forward and we are already moving forward but having this dismal backwards looking outlook does not serve anybody and at least of all serves the planet we're so fixated on all the bad choices that have been made in the past and can people continue to make that we forget how much progress we've made like there are so many european and 
not just European, but countries in this world that have peaked in their carbon emissions. They peaked in their carbon emissions years ago, and it's just a constant climb down. So for every graphic that you see with a red line of all these horrible things, there is another graphic with a green line showing all the positive changes that have been made. So I encourage you to listen to the people that are working on this night and day and have dedicated their lives to it and get a gritty real life optimism. And that involves really thinking about every choice you make and trying to do better. Is it gonna be perfect? Absolutely not. That is not what's necessary and that's not what we're going for. We're going for better, we're going for supporting each other and we're going for staying positive because we have done really hard things on this planet. We have overcome really hard things and we still have to overcome a lot more, but we're not gonna do it with doom and gloom. That is all on that. Okay. Last thing is life. Isn't it funny to keep the last thing is life? Just a, a little tiny topic of life. Um, I did want to tell you that, you know, just this space for me is such a true and authentic space. And it requires from me a lot of emotional bandwidth um, to output something that's genuine and sometimes when life so i have to run my life kind of like that on all fronts and just transitioning from summer to back to regular life has just required so much emotional bandwidth on other the other fronts of my life that i just couldn't show up i needed to like take a break from one front so i appreciate um, Y'all understanding that, but I did want to talk about just for so many of us, it's the season when our kids are going back to school. And I think it's easy to forget just what a transition it is for all of us, kids and parents and communities alike to go back to that. Because so the first week or two, I guess I, it caught me off guard. You know, my son is in eighth grade now. My older son is in eighth grade. My younger daughter is going into, she's in fourth grade now. And you know, by eighth grade, you kind of think you've got the hang of this. Like we know what school is like. We know what re-entry into that routine is like. And it just, it really did catch me off guard what a difficult transition it would be for my son particularly to get back to school. I think in the summer, like they're just, they're so used to having a little more freedom and having more of you and your support and love and their siblings or friends that they love and want to see. And then they have to go back to this place where everything is so much more regimented and there's all these expectations and they have to behave a certain way and they have to be surrounded by people that some of whom they might not like and there might be tensions there and I think we discount the fact that as adults, we can just sometimes remove ourselves from situations where we're not thrilled, but our kids are required to show up eight hours a day sometimes and like be kind and be understanding and be a leader and be a friend and try your best and show up. And that is, it's just a lot. And I just think there's nothing harder as a parent than seeing your kids struggle in that way, in any way, but like in the emotional way where even the most well-adjusted of them, like my son, I believe is so well-adjusted, but it was still really hard when he went back to school and like, you know, different friends are making different choices now and things have changed. And one of his really good friends has a girlfriend now and that changed the dynamic between him and his friend. And it was really emotionally difficult and I think our instinct as parents is like, we want to fix it. We want to take the pain away. We want to change the situation because there's just nothing harder than watching our kids struggle emotionally. And the real thing to remember is it's not 
just them. It's not just kids. It's not just adults. Life is emotionally difficult. Life is a constant emotional struggle. And what they need from us is not to fix it. It's just to witness it. It's just to stand there, sit there, listen, nod and say, I totally understand. I've been there. I'm there still. If I'm not there today, I was there yesterday. If I'm not there yesterday, I was, I'll be there tomorrow. There's nothing wrong with you. It's a struggle. But I think when they know there's nothing strange or wrong about it, that it's just truly inherent to being a human being to feel left out sometimes, to feel victorious sometimes, to struggle sometimes, to be winning sometimes. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing to fix. All we can do is say, you know what? Your family, we're always your people. No matter what is happening in the rest of the world, that's, what I, that's the only thing I can say to my kids is no matter what happens at school, I'm always your safe place to land. This family is always from now till infinity your safe place to land and I think once we remember it is not our job to fix their problems just to witness their problems it not only relieves us it it just you're doing your child the biggest favor in the world when we do that is remind like setting them up to know in life there are emotional ups and downs and that they are completely capable of weathering them and they don't have to fix them. I think that's why people end up abusing alcohol and drugs or uh, becoming workaholics or whatever your ism is, your alcoholism or your workaholism, it's to numb that emotional challenge. But when we realize some days you're up, some days you're down. If you're down, you're guaranteed to be up here soon. It just makes it a lot easier to handle. And I think when we do that for them as children, as younger people, then we're setting them up for much greater success in life. Um, I remember hearing Dr. Lisa Demore, who specializes in adolescence and has written incredibly helpful books and has an incredibly helpful podcast, she talks about kind of being, thinking of yourself as a trash bag. Like when your kids come to you after school, think about just opening a trash bag and being the receptacle. They're going to dump all their crap on you. They're going to tell you the woes that are their life, the worst things that happen. And a lot of times I'm like, dude, you think you have a bad, like you don't even have to do anything hard. Like, but they're just dumping all their emotional stuff on you because they had to hold it together all day long, which is not an easy feat. So just hold that bag open, smile and nod empathetically, and then you go dump that bag in the trash and move on. You don't have to fix anything. You just have to hold the trash bag. So if you, my friend, have been struggling with re-entry like I have been, you are not alone. It is completely normal. Nothing is wrong with your child. Your child will thrive because they have you and they have all the other wonderful adults and companions in their lives and they will be just fine because we're all in the same boat. They're just smaller humans and just like you have ups and downs, so do they. So that is where I am at with my, um, with my life and I'm feeling much better. A couple of weeks in, I feel acclimated and I fall into the same traps. So when my son was complaining, I was like saying to my husband, maybe we need to apply to a different school. Maybe he needs to move for high school. Maybe X, maybe Y. And then a couple of weeks go by and I'm like, no, maybe you just have to get over the hump of adjustment and some things in every situation are good and some things in every situation are bad. So you don't have to change anything. You just have to be patient and Thank you for being patient with me as I reacclimated to normal life because woo, life's a doozy, y'all. This is why we knit. I am a knitaholic, but I guess it's a better way to cope than a lot of other things. So anyway, that is all on that front. I am reading Demon Copperhead right now. And oh my God, for all the hesitation I had in starting that book for months, I maybe even year, a year, I was like, nope, 
I don't have the emotional capability to handle that book because I knew it would be emotionally heavy. And indeed, it is emotionally heavy. But, oh boy, the reward is so great. It has been a journey. One of you said, um, enjoy... I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact words, but you had sent me a comment and said like, enjoy all his struggles and all his successes. And that's it. that stuck with me so deeply throughout the journey of this book. It just felt like truly traveling his life with him. And it was heartbreaking and absolutely transcendent in equal parts. I am almost done. I am really close to the end and I I feel so grateful for fiction because I believe it is truly the thing that it's like this tool to broaden the capacity of your heart and your mind. It's like it allows you to travel backwards and forwards and sideways in time and place and just make you more human. And I feel like that's all there is in life is to become more human and have more empathy. And so many of our problems are when we other people, right? Like, oh, well, that's them. That's those people. My people are superior in whatever way, shape or form. But when we read and we experience a novel like Barbara Kingsolver's fictional world in this novel that's reflective of her real world because it is very much reflective of the real world, we just develop this, I don't know, we broaden our hearts and I, I am just, I have infinite gratitude for authors that can do that because, you know, The Covenant of Water took me to a world that was so rich and broad and huge and incredible. I mean, this novel transported me to a 100% different world, but as expansive and as broadening as Covenant. So couldn't recommend it enough. Just so grateful for the genius that can put out work like that. Um, and just couldn't, I just couldn't be more grateful that I read, got to read this book. It's just beautiful. Don't know what I'm going to read next, but it's going to be a tough act to follow. Um, it might be another Barbara Kingsolver book. I read the Poisonwood Bible so long ago. I mean, I couldn't have been more than a teenager. And I think from the perch of my 40s, it will be a much more impactful, meaningful book to me. So um, I might I might check that out. Um, the final thing I will tell you, because the last time I saw you, I was in literal tears about my dog, Danny, who was at a trainer for a month to deal with her leash aggression. She is back and she is doing so well so well. I have to tell you that because you guys were so sweet and supportive and asked after her and it would be wrong of me not to update you and tell you that she is doing so well. She thrived at the trainer and she's her leash aggression is so 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 much better and now I feel like we have the tools to work with her and continue to make her a more confident dog and you know It's so cliche to say that sometimes you don't value something until it's gone. And honestly, it was a gift for her, to me, for her to be taken away for some time because I value my dogs so much more than I did before. I always have loved them. I'm always obsessed with animals. I would have 10 dogs if I could do it reasonably, which I can't. But having her taken away it just made me realize how much I value their companionship in my life and how much richer my life is for having them in it. And they're both so different from each other. Like yesterday, I was um, working on the podcast, sitting on the patio. It was a beautiful, cool fall morning. We walked the dogs and one of my, my other dog, Scout, the great peer and I were sitting on the patio. And I was just sitting there reading and thinking and, and processing for the, to prepare for this podcast. And 
I just kept looking over at her. I was looking and thinking while I was looking at all the beautiful bushes and flowers and there were all these birds and hummingbirds and butterflies and bees kind of buzzing around and she too was just taking it all in and she was just sitting there so fully present in that moment just absorbing her surroundings and I could just see her little nose working and her eyes and her ears and she was so relaxed and happy and I can tell you there was no place on this planet I would have rather been than just there with her in that moment just dogs are so very present and you know the trainer when he dropped her off we talked for a long time and he was just saying how humans are so incapable of staying present and just accepting what is we're constantly over personalizing the world and projecting ourselves backwards in times and forward in times and he was saying like you know, we could have a bad interaction in traffic in the morning and we're still hung up on it at dinner time, talking about it with our family when it had nothing to do with us. That person was just going through their day and doing their own thing and we make it about us. Whereas dogs, you tell them to stop doing something and you show them a consequence and they're like, okay, I guess it's a new uh, state of affairs around here. And they adjust and go about their business. They're not mulling it over. Or they're not creating emotional baggage to carry through the rest of their week. And there's just so much to learn from that. It's like the same human capabilities that have allowed us to evolve and make these big cultures. It's a double-edged sword. It's the same thing that keeps us from enjoying this present moment and being completely alive and aware in this moment. And like being reminded of that and then being in their presence I've just found that it's brought me, it keeps reminding me to come back to this moment and stop wishing for the next moment or wondering what would have happened if something had been different. Just be like your dog. Be a much better person and be like your dog um, or your cat or whatever your animal is. But anyway, I'm thrilled to have her back. I'm thrilled to have that just eternally wagging tail following us around, eternally looking for snacks, but always happy. So that is my update on that. And I have now officially nothing left to say to you. Um, I knew it'd be a long one because I had a lot built up to share, but I'm so excited to be here with you guys. I hope you have had a lovely two weeks. If re-entry to fall regularly scheduled programming has been a challenge, you are not alone. Um, hang in there you will soon acclimate and the MCAL will soon start. And if you are doing it, then you're so excited. If you're not doing it, stay strong. Don't feel peer pressure to join in, okay? You can just hang out and watch it unfold and then you don't have the pressure of finishing it, okay? And after the first week, maybe you're like, that looks rad, I'm jumping in. Then you jump in. No, nothing lost. I hope your weekend is Full of fabulous knitting and enjoying some fall weather. I will see you next week, my friends. Take good care. Bye.